Uh, our final speaker uh, is Michael Casey. Uh, he featured prominently in an AMA that we did. I think you're one of the few that's done all three of, you've checked the box of all three scale tech things, uh, in person, a Zoom AMA and uh, uh, dinner. Uh, Michael has a background as a reporter covering the, the global economy, uh, then has worked with MIT's um, Media Lab on the blockchain project. Maybe I get this wrong. Mm -hmm. uh, I am going to mention your books, The Coming Age of Cryptocurrency. I failed to mention that last time. Uh, and is currently the uh, chief content officer at uh, Coindesk, which is the most trusted voice in everything to do with decentralized futures and economies and so on. He's also a fascinating speaker. Uh, I've had the great fortune to work with him on a number of things. He's always got an unusual take on the world. And I believe having seen some of these slides, this is going to be no exception. So welcome, Michael. Okay. Thanks, Alistair. Um, yeah, look, I, I, I think I feel like I'm in the comic relief or something, because like, you've all got this uh, news you can use, homework to take home. These guys have done a tremendous job of laying out all the challenges of startups and how to get to work and make this thing, this difficult job of running a company figure itself out. I'm not going to do any of that. I'm, I'm actually just going to sit here and pontificate as, I, as is my want. I'm just a speaker, a thinker, a writer, and I can let you guys go and solve all the problems, right? It's much easier that way. Uh, so I'm just talking about really what I see as something that's interesting. Um, specifically, I'm going to be talking about really the entertainment arts and culture industry, which I think is really at the heart of, like we live in a, we're all content creators now, right? So in some respects, this is the digital economy and where it's going. But I'm specifically gonna talk about some of the, what I see as the interesting trends that are happening in the evolution of our culture. As a result, now it's about NFTs, right? And um, this is what most people I think think about when they when they think about uh, NFTs. They they're thinking about the Board Ape Yacht Club. I'm sure you've all heard about them. You know, um, uh, ver various celebrities own them, and there's lots of talk about these degens. These uh, literally, the name Board Ape Yacht Club is about. It was derived from the idea that there's a lot of rich crypto kids who've made a lot of money, bought Bitcoin at some ridiculously low level, and now they don't know what to do, th do with themselves. And so they imagined a universe of them all just being bored and wealthy and not having anything to do. So it's hardly an inspiring idea, right? This isn't, this isn't really something that you think, wow, the, the, the change of culture, the Web3 world, we are entering into an entirely new definition of the internet, and we get these rich uh, kind of rather cynical apes as the standard bearers for the whole thing. The reality is the Board Ape Yacht Club is really interesting on a, on a number of levels when you abstract away the actual content. Um, there's a really interesting dynamics around the idea of community that are formed around this, which I think is a key element of what Web3 is going to be all about. And the way in which Yuga Labs, the company that really got this thing going, has worked with copyright and assigned those rights to derivative rights to all the sort of child uh, NFTs holders is really interesting in terms of the way that they collectively build value. So there's a lot of really interesting things about the apes, but really it's just a tiny piece of what NFTs are all about. So uh, to a real estate investor, those at least who are thinking outside the box right now and trying to imagine what NFTs might mean to them, this is what NFTs mean. It's, it's actually about taking something that is physical, uh, giving it the permanence that obviously a property deed needs to have. There can only be one property deed. If we're disputing who's actually got the deed, then we're really not doing our job of, of, of defining ownership of houses and real estate, right? So the NFTs are really important, right? I'm, I'm, I'm just guessing you guys have got a reasonable idea. I haven't got, I'm not going to go into the details of it, but obviously we're using the blockchain as a mechanism to identify in time uh, an association with some other asset a tokenized representation of this. And so there's a moment that says, you associated this property deed with this NFT, boom. It's now digitized in a way that we can trust. It's not gonna be replicated as the, as the internet's sort of original sin was. We, could just, we, couldn't, we couldn't create digital scarcity in the internet. Now we have the capacity to do so, at least through this sort of associated operation. And it becomes really interesting from the idea of what this might mean for, for property investors. I could fragmented, I could fractionalize, because it's, it's, it's digital, right? You know, Mark Andreessen told us that software is eating the world, and why? Because it's capable of doing all sorts of things that the physical and analog world can't do. So we could fractionalize these mortgage deeds, we could have multiple owners, we could think very, very differently about what it is to own a home and how this works. Uh, to a cancer researcher, NFTs could mean something else. 
All right? They could be, I'm donating to a cause that I care about, my genetic information, because I would like to see its passage through time as it is being used by these researchers to find some cure for melanoma, right? And the idea that an NFT, yet once again, an original, unique, scarce marker is now applied to information, the traceability of that thing, because it's mine, it's uniquely mine, can now be used in a really constructive way. I could incentivize people to donate their, their genetic information, not because they get paid for it, but because they're going to see and learn from the uh, information that they are you know, happily contributing to this common cause. It's actually a project that are some students that I worked with um, at MIT worked on. I was, I've always been inspired by their vision. So first of all, before we get into where I really want to go with this though, is that so let's say NFTs are not, right? NFTs are not actual pieces of media. That's a, the media is separate from the token, right? And, and I think this is a confusion for some people. It's the association of that media with a blockchain entry that creates the token that gives the power to this. But that's why the whole right click thing that people talk about is a little bit of a misunderstanding about what's going on. It's really not the point. We don't really care about the fact that you can actually copy the actual media. It's whether or not you can stake a claim to having been the, you know, having some rightful claim on that via the, the private keys that you hold in relation to that token. Uh, it is a stepping stone towards sort of legal proof of ownership, but it is not in and of itself legal pro pro proof of ownership. It is a means by which you can exercise a, a control and make a statement, if you like, about your connection to this. Uh, and the key word is legal, because you still, you still need the law to be able to sort of determine, de determine whether this in fact represents property. We don't, we're not there yet. There's much of that needs to happen. And, they're not, and, and for that same reason, they're not really digital property in and of themselves. I mean, they may become, if, if, if courts can start to one day say, this is property, this is indeed yours, and uh, we can get there, but there's, there's still some ambiguity around that. So you need to remember there's, a, there's this uh, digital world that we in the crypto world like to talk about as if it is a proxy for ownership and property, but we really do need the courts to come along and say, yes, this is, we agree, this is it. We still have things to have to happen within the superstructure of our economy for this to happen. What are they? I like to think of them as online serial numbers, right? So, you know, a serial number, we all learn it is in a physical sense. We've never been able to do that in the digital sense, and now we can. So I'm putting this number on this thing. So that's a useful thing. Think of how useful serial numbers are. Now we have a useful version of that in the online world. And again, while I'm, you know, like equivocating a little bit about the idea of law, they are a form of claim, and it's an executable digital claim. I can do something with this that claims it. And therefore, as a result, they are an element, but not the only one, of what is ultimately going to be the digital property solution. Um, that we can actually have this notion of digital property. We are on it. This, NFTs are, as I see it, a stepping stone towards this concept. And therefore, they are a pathway to digital property rights. And I'm saying that this is going to set up a decades in the making shift in, uh, in our economy and in capitalism generally. And the reason I've got Deng Xiaoping up there is because he's in the, he, he, his actions in China are an example of the numerous moments through history in which some shift in property rights has come along and had a massive transformative impact on, uh, on, on, on wealth, on property, on wealth creation and expansion. So, you know, we had Mao Zedong. He, uh, he, he passes away, there's a big struggle for power, and eventually Deng comes into power, you know, more or less takes charge around 1982. And one of the things that he does that's absolutely critical to China's subsequent massive growth, he assigns the right to own your property to Chinese homeowners everywhere. It's seen as one of the foundational elements of what happened there, because now people had something to care about, to be invested in. So there's lots of moments in history like this, right? The, the creation of the Dutch East India Company, this whole moment, a new version of property rights. There's this whole conversation around what happened with the Magna Carta when the nobles in, in, in the UK did. There is uh, you know, a lot of work that Hernando de Soto, the famous uh, Peruvian economist, has done to try to establish the lack of property rights being a factor in the, the underdevelopment of certain countries, et cetera, et cetera. This is a big deal. But the Digital economy, which is our economy, this is what we live in. We live in a digital economy. We haven't been able to establish the notion of property rights until now. Um, so 
if you just stretch that out a little bit, like, wow. <laughs> if we now bring this transformative idea into the realm of the internet, it, let, there's something pretty big could happen here, right? This is a, a, a big deal. Um, we don't know, it might not work, and it could actually sort of be dystopian in the long run. But at the end of the day, the, I, it's hard not to imagine that the notion of digital scarcity is actually very important. Um, and it's, it's certainly a game changer for the attention economy, right? The attention economy is, is <laughs> I know, it's a bit of a disturbing image. Um, <laughs> But you know, from very early in life, we are just like our eyeballs are what matter in this economy. It is, and it's the one thing that is still scarce. And uh, you know, Alistair likes to talk a lot about uh, you know abundance versus scarcity. And and the thing that I always think about when it comes to this is well, the one thing that we cannot get any more of is time. So as a result, there is this massive competition for our eyeballs for our time, and the idea that we can actually uh, you know interact with that that time more constructively in a in a peer to peer relationship is what I want to talk about now because it's all about you know content being the driver of the economy how do we uh, turn it into something of value in, unto itself so let me play this little video here and, and the key point which I look at is like who gets to, who defines the ad attention economy who is the entity that decides what we watch what we don't watch and so forth because that battle is 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 such a critical element of this You don't need to watch the whole thing. Um, <laughs> maybe you want to, right? It's pretty compelling. Um, look, it, it, the point here is not to actually get involved in this film and its, and, and its narrative. This is a trailer for a film called Sift. Um, you know, it's, it's an obvious dystopian moment. There's robots taking over the world. We, we, we've seen this trope before. So in that sense, it's not particularly groundbreaking as a piece of content. What's really interesting to me is the production values of this thing. Pretty good, right? You'd think this is put on by a major film studio. All of this has been done by one single human being. And it's, he, he does the animation, he does the, uh, the film, he does the script writing, he does the acting, he does the whole thing. And that's, we know, is possible because, you know, the technologies that have improved so much. Also, he's obviously a fairly talented, multifaceted uh, uh, creator. But with combining that with all of these new technology for production has allowed him to do this. But what's also really important is he's able to self-fund this. And this is his, uh, this is his, on foundations, he sells these little, they're called tombstones, and they're just little segments of, um, of the film, and they sell for one ETH, uh, this one here is one ETH, the reserve price for it, you know, one and a half thousand dollars each, and that's how he funds this whole thing. What's really interesting is like, there's no film studio in this, there doesn't need to be one, right? We, we heard from, from uh, Hedge Film, was it, jo John, the, the name? Film head, sorry, uh, you know, about different ways we fund these things. This is another new model altogether, another step beyond this. And the idea that, that we don't have to have uh, the film studios dictating this stuff, I think, is really important and interesting. Um, so these are gatekeepers, right? Film studios, record labels, et cetera, et cetera. And they've been with us and they've, been, they've basically been defining our culture for centuries. The church was the one that would dictate what we got to read and think about in the early, you know, certainly within you know, you know, Christendom. Um, you know, and then, then Gutenberg comes along and invents the printing press and newspapers and everything else eventually come out of this. And that becomes, they're the gatekeepers, right? And I'm a journalist and I, I, I was used to, to all of that. Um, Television studios is another way that we're getting, we're certainly having gatekeepers, but we're pushing out this information wider and wider. There's still this centralized role. You know, Christie's determines which art should be bought and sold and other galleries and others do the same. We just talked about film studios, MGM, EMI. I mean, throughout history, the process has become more and more democratized, but there's still gatekeepers. 
Anyway, that was the web, that was the pre-internet world, right? And we still obviously have the vestiges of it. Now we have in this one, the web two, and we talk a lot about, oh my God, it's all opened up. There's so much interesting stuff going on. Um, you know, the, the, the power of the studios, in fact, John and I were talking earlier about this, are, you know, is not what it was. It's now, they're funded by outside investors and Netflix will give some sort of guarantee that you can get your film up and ultimately that's how it gets funded. However, there's still a gatekeeping process. The algorithms that run these things are dictating what we get and what, and therefore what you subtly or not are going to have to create. You have to play to the algorithm. Anybody who's had to do SEO around <laughs> anything knows how annoying it is to have to keep up with Google's algorithm, right? So without gate gatekeepers, who decides what art, what's art and what isn't? I think this is a really important and profound question. This is a thing that was kind of interesting. The, um, the rocks, you guys, anyone see this? that have took the world by storm. People were buying these rocks and they were paying you know, $300,000. And this rather snide journalist says, but you can always download the original clip art for a dollar. As if to say, why would you, right? But this gets us to the point I was making before. There's a big difference between the actual image and the right to claim it. Nonetheless, I'm not sure I would buy a rock image. It doesn't quite strike me as a massive contribution. However, for some people, it's art. It's a statement of some port, right? Um, Here's another person doing a lot with NFTs, um, a, a young trans man called Ferocious, um, who does a lot of wild, colorful stuff and sells for quite a lot, right? $2.8 million for this one here, 437. This guy's doing really well. He's got, a, he's got a Christie's commission and various other things as well. Um, but he's a really interesting person because he's a young trans person who is discovering this capacity to express himself in ways, would he have in a pre-NFT world had the same success that he's had? Would he, would he have this presence? I don't know, maybe, but there really is something quite powerful about the fact that he's using this mechanism. That's what his first entry into the market was. Yes, of course, Christie's and others are coming after him now, but it begins with this idea of empowerment. So would th this is a process by which art I see as being redefined. And this is another case of the same thing, Diana Sinclair, she's a wonderful young human being producing incredible art. And she's now also at Christie's, uh, but, but again, began through NFTs. Um, and she says, she says, it's a huge message to the centuries old art market. So this is just about art, but you know, it's, it's, a, it, it's, it's really about everybody's participation in this process that I think is really interesting. So what about the other side of the market? You know, can we democratize art collecting itself? Like, so, we are, like the idea that a lot of NFTs are owned by wealthier collectors, but there's this beauty to this idea that we're pushing this stuff out so we can get to decide what we like and what we don't. And then what happens when we fractionalize, I was talking about that happening with the uh, property deeds. We can think about that with regards to art as well. You know, and now there's, there's all these mutual funds that are talking about how I might be able to design for you a portfolio in which you get this fractionalized ownership of some form of art in there. Um, the whole thing starts to look really quite different than from the existing uh, cultural economy that we live in. So here's the thing, you know, throughout history, from the early, earliest beginnings, cave paintings, we all know this, you know, art has defined the kind of society that we are. And I'm using art obviously very broadly here, it's, it's music, it's film, it's it's, it's the whole shebang, it's, it's ideas, it's books, it's, it's, it's ideas generally. Um, and so shouldn't society define its art? And I think that's the point, is that if you're really trying to think about what this means in the big picture of things, if, if, if culture and the art that leads us to, to define what that is, is something that has been throughout history maintained by these gatekeepers, if there's a new mechanism by which that process is now an exchange between we, the consumers of that art, and they, or also us, because again, we're all creators in some form, the creators. What does that mean for where our culture goes? What exactly are we talking about here? It, it's a, it, it is, I would suggest, if this works, this is a radically different trajectory in which we actually come to understand who we are and what we care about, because it's, it's opening the whole thing up entirely. So I just want to leave you with that thought and you know, wherever you want to go with this, happy to go, Alistair. We have several questions already. Uh, thank you so much, Michael. Um, I would love to 
love to see the QR code up here. And then you can uh, go ahead and scan that and question Michael. Um, before we get into those, I've heard it said that there are three ways humans govern themselves. <clears throat> There's human society with the monarch or emperor or pharaoh off to the side, different by divine providence or something. There's human society run from the top down by an elite ruling class, a uh, dictatorial or totalitarian model. Not necessarily bad, but let's say parental, yeah. right? Yeah, parental, and yeah. then there's the liberal model, and I don't mm -hmm. mean liberal in terms of liberal and conservative. I mean liberalism, meaning bottoms up, the market rules itself. Mm -hmm. It sounds like what you just described is that up until now, we've had totalitarian top-down tastemaking. And this is the liberal, the arrival of liberalism mm -hmm. into culture in a way that wasn't there before. I think it is, although I would suggest that over time it has been, that's why I start with the church, right? That was just one, the only person in the town who could read was the priest. Well, that was probably by design, right? So you will listen to me. I'm the only one that can actually read the word of God and, and therefore you need me to deliver that to you. So you don't really get any choice in what you're going to hear and read about in that, that scenario. You know, and then Gutenberg blew it all open and now everybody could start to read more and we could disseminate that information. And everyone could read a Bible as long as they could learn to read um, and, 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 and so forth, right? So then we lead to mass media that's now funded by advertisers, which then again removes the central entity, whether it's the church or the state from that process. Then we end up with you know, broadcast, radio, which spreads it even further. And then the internet itself, uh, something that blows open far more widely the number of participants in that process, but yes, still has the centralizing entities, the, 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 the profit-making, uh, powerful, aggregating platforms in the middle of it. And so, so yes, we still haven't been able to shake the yoke of that background, but I do think we've, we've democratized. What I'm suggesting is this next step is by far the most radical. And, so and it's it, a continuum. It's not readily, it's, it's a, pretty yeah, huge. Absolutely right. a continuum. But I think this is a big, a big leap precisely because it gets to the actual funding of production, right? There's this idea that you, know, you can't really have free speech unless you have the means to pay for that speech. So I guess to get philosophical a bit more, um, we're humans. We still want social approval. We want to, our peers to agree with us and so on. And so I might decide to buy a rock because my friends will think it's funny that I have a rock. And in that regard, I'm still influenced by them. And there are still algorithms influencing that I now know my friends think it's funny. Yeah. There's all, you never buy art just for yourself. Maybe some people do, but it feels like we can never escape the gatekeepers who provide the interaction and the social feedback that that thing is true. So can you, what are your thoughts yeah, on no, like no, culture I think that's and tastemaking? That's a fair point, right? I mean, you, yes, you, you certainly, and the algorithm can be a metaphor for not just uh, a software algorithm, but like whatever that cultural algorithm that keeps like buzzing in our ear that, yeah, you know, this is the cool, these are the cool sneakers, not those ones, right? So. Yeah, I, I, I'm not saying that everything suddenly is completely a level playing field. And I think that's a sort of a myth of the almost liberal mindset right? that you can get to that, that there's not some sort of pre-existing influence in the way that we think and what we buy. But I do think that there are literal obstacles that a person like Dana Sinclair was up against all the time that she now no longer has and that that is really powerful. Right. And so at least she gets a chance to compete with, you know, uh, a Damien Hurst or whomever to, 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 to be a relevant contributor to the cultural conversation. And, um, and, and yeah, maybe she then becomes the driver of taste and we're all, we're all madly following the Diana Sinclair cool thing. But that in itself is a big shift. A young 18 year old black girl from Oakland, right? Is quite different from, from, from what the traditional sort of tastemakers have been. Okay, we're going to get um, into a couple of questions related to startups now in the time we have left. Uh, and if you want a particular question answered, go into your app and you can actually vote up the ones you like more so that I don't just ask them in order, but they're good questions. Uh, you reference a lot of history. Um, how important is it for founders to be well-read and have a historical perspective? Uh, I think when it comes to um, certainly uh, the digital economy, you have to be. Like I just... Everything, don't you feel like everything's accelerating right now? 
You know, I, I mean, it, it just, it, it, and AI is a part of this, of course, but so too is globalization. So is everything that we've done in the last 40 years from basically, you know, the, 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 the beginnings of the computing revolution into the end of the Cold War and so forth. And it, it's meant that everything moves faster. And yet, when you watch these cycles, whether it's the financial crisis of 2008, this moment right now when the dollar is so frigging predictably doing what it does when the world breaks down, it is soaring and it's creating massive problems for little countries that are stuck. And this happens every Hey, don't call time. us a little country. <laughs> Yeah, Canada is actually a good way to think about it, right? I mean, you, Canada actually has a nice safety net because you, you're not. But if you're a Lebanon or a Sri Lanka or whatever right now, you're caught up in this system. This happens repeatedly, and yet it will have massive implications, right? The IMF is meeting this week. They're going to have to make all sorts of decisions about that, and that will feed into decisions about what currencies we use, which is going to affect every single startup, right? So, yeah, I think you know, this is me thinking from a macro level. But I also think that just purely from a somewhat more micro level, you know, digital trends, right? I mean, I was listening to some of the, the conversations about uh, strategies for product market fit and so forth. And all well, that's great. I'm not in any way, take all that, that advice and run with it. However, um, you know, what if the whole idea of a company and who is deciding on these things is about to be disrupted by the concept of a DAO, right? Are we, are we going to actually blow up uh, the model for what organization is. And to, to understand what that might look like, you have to go back into history and think about the history of guilds and collectives and cooperatives and things like that. So I just think precisely because the paradigm is so at, at risk of shifting radically, you need some frame of reference to understand what that paradigm shift might mean for you, and history brings that to you. Um. One way I've seen NFTs described, and this reflected in a couple of these questions, is the securitization of everything. Um, when you are Lloyds of London and you put an insurance policy on something, you've basically created a value for it. When you create you know, uh, mortgages, you're securitizing property, you can bundle them up and so on. What does the securitization of everything change that founders should think about? Well, first of all, I'm going to say that I think that's partially correct but it, it's like as i was saying about the legal piece it's not yet like securitization literally is a reference to the capacity to take something as collateral and then exec execute on that in a legal context right this is a this i think is going to enable our capacity to 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 do that do that in the digital realm and then once we get the legal framework in place yes i do think the possibility to securitize everything gets really interesting um what i think it means in the good sense, right? Because you know some of this stuff looks like scary in terms of how uncertain it is, but it it means an enormous amount more liquidity. We, you know, we're living in an environment now where people are worried about being short of cash because prices are rising and wages aren't, et cetera, else. But the idea that so much more capital could be unlocked because you could design models of of you know capital formation that are smaller, larger, more nimble, whatever, I think is, is really interesting. Now, one of the things I think is really interesting about NFTs, and certainly NFTs that are uh, based on art and cultural content, that for, for which the core sense of value is copyright. Again, once we get the legal part of this figured out, we can actually embed, right, Jen, uh, <laughs> legal, legally definable rights into an NFT contract then there's something really quite remarkably powerful in terms of liquidity that comes out of that. Because any other asset, let's, let's think of a home, if I want to get liquidity against my home, I have to give up control of all of it or a portion of it, right? Um, even if I am in a, you know, a Wall Street bond trader and I'm sitting on a treasury bond and I want to get some overnight return on this, I have to give up control. Like somebody borrows the bond, I've got no longer control of it. They then short sell it and then give me the money later on. But an artist has their asset. I painted this painting. It's mine. I'll, here, here, I'll sell you a print if you like. You can even buy the painting, but I still retain the copyright. And now what I can do, I can commercialize that. Go ahead. I've still got the art. I'll do another deal with you, another deal, another, another, another deal, right? So there's this sense that you can actually, I mean, not presumably ad infinitum because you then saturate the market and its value would go. But there's something really quite dynamic about the liquidity that comes with that. 
um, you know, and it might be a real problem. I mean, it might mean that we ended up like sort of creating this very powerful. I was going to say, do, does that lead to basically rent taking on existence, where everyone has to securitize their life when they're born, and then I mean, you know, yeah, I mean, work forever? yes, yes. I mean, do we do we do we end up in a dystopian world in which, like, you know, uh, now we're all being rated right in terms of our own performance and 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 this whole sort of hewing back to some basic market price. I'm going to short Michael Casey because I didn't yeah, like that should. talk. Yeah, yeah you know. should. Be. Yeah, yeah. Uh, we have time for a couple more. These are great questions. Uh, art has often been associated with status. For example, collecting art has a status association. Are NFTs just the same status game digitally or is it fundamentally different, uh, a fundamentally different form of status? I think it's the same. Um, but what I will say is that I would take out the word just. I mean, Status is everything, let's face it, right? I mean, it's like, why does, um, what does Jeff Bezos need? How many is he worth, what's he worth now? Or, 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 or I mean, Musk is different because he's got a whole, he wants to take us to the moon. But like, you know, a, a very wealthy billionaire is constantly accumulating, you know, incrementally large amounts of money that mean absolutely zero, nothing, zip to how their actual experience of life from a material sense is going to be. What they get are bragging rights, you know, I'm the biggest, fattest, loudest, whatever. Um, and it's the same with the art. I mean, it, it, for many, many people, it's, I am the one. Particularly when it comes to high-end art, right? It's this bragging rights. And, um, and that's why it really doesn't, this idea of owning the art as opposed to the NFT is really important. Because people think, well, you know, if everyone can, everyone can look at your art, what, you know, what's the value to you? Surely you want to put it in your home and hide it from everybody so they can't use it. That's not how wealthy people treat art. They want the whole world to see it. They fund exhibits and they lend it out and they want the whole world to know that they are the ones who basically funded this thing. They're the benefactor. The, our entire economy is built around flex and bragging rights. It really is, right? And it comes right down to the, we were talking about sneakers and the clothing we wear and everything else. I, I've got a Rolex, you know, that says something about me. This is like, crucial to you know you're going up maslow's hierarchy of needs once you end up being in that self-actualization phase you do all you care about are things like you know what's how am i being perceived and what i'm saying i mean that sounds really shallow but it's a huge part of our economy so and, and the thing is like what can we do with this technology to make sure that we take that human instinct of showing off and steer it into constructive things right could we design nfts that rise in value if there is some positive environmental outcome related to that. So now I get to brag about supporting something, but I'm also engaged almost in directly and inexorably into something that is actually improving the world rather than just the Koch brothers putting their name on MIT's buildings. Uh, last question. Yep. Um, and this, I'm going to paraphrase this a little bit. Um, it seems like channels have generally flattened. The fact that any one of these people can now become a gatekeeper of their own or they can sell their product or whatever um, but that means that there are more opportunities for business models or products with room for exactly one merchant and then the example that's quoted here is stuffy cleaning i think i read about this woman she started a youtube a TikTok channel showing her cleaning her stuffies <laughs> and and now people send her their stuffies to be cleaned and she has a line of like stuffy cleaning products <laughs> but she's like the person yeah like, that's not a big market yeah there's room for one but you can dominate that market yeah. Um, how does this change the world for startups? Before, you know, you had competitive ecosystem. Now, because of the, the targeting, you can go after one very small market where you're the only vendor in a place where before someone might never have been able to reach all the people interested in that product. That's really interesting. Um, I think... Um, so, so I have grappled with this idea that, you know, do, do we just go from the existing monopolies to a new form of monopoly, right? That, that for every Fawoltius, there's actually thousands of young, brilliant artists who haven't made it. And so at the end of the day, everything just goes to Fawoltius because Fawoltius is a name and that's it. And you go there. And so we're ultimately we're back in the same place. Um, and yeah, I don't know. We, we, we probably will never get out of that. But I do think, again, as I said, we are, I don't think the channels are flat, by the way, but I do think we're, we're having, again, this continuum, we've got an element of this. What this concept is really interesting about, though, is that the impact is not so much necessarily about breaking open the market so that multiple people can gain access to one market, but rather that the, there's a proliferation of new business models that we haven't thought about.
I mean, who would have thought that there would be a business line for serve, you know, cleaning your stuffies, that that actually would be a business model? So I suppose one message to startups would be like, think about those, right? Don't necessarily think about how do I get into an existing market, but how does this sort of proliferation of flattening openings and channels give you a chance to just imagine an entirely different uh, way to, to make money and to, and to service a need?